Welcome back. This is Dr. Jin Sun, where clinical excellence meets excellent results. It's 2021, and today we're going to talk about infertility. We're going to go over some facts and definitions about infertility because this is a very common process but often not spoken about publicly because it's a pretty sensitive topic, right? So infertility, when we look at this, infertility affects 10 to 15% of couples, right? It is the most common disease for the ages of 20 to 45 years old, okay? The definition here is the inability to conceive after 12 months of actively trying. But when you get to the age of 35 years and older, your ability to conceive after six months or the inability to conceive after six months puts you into that definition of infertility. 85% of normal fertility will conceive in the first year. So a normal healthy couple uh, in the first year of trying will conceive, 85% of them. Healthy women, 20 to 30 years old, they have a chance of <clears throat> conceiving 25 to 30 percent each month. So every every month you have a chance of 20 to 30 percent each month. Okay, but when you get to the age of 40 years and older, the ability to conceive goes down to less than 10 percent each month. Right? These are huge differences between certain age groups. So the old adage of your time is ticking is true because you go over the age of 35, it becomes more difficult for the female to conceive. Now, infertility is not just a female issue. It oftentimes is a male issue. So if you look at the infertility rates as a general, one third of the women have issues with infertility. One third of men have issues with infertility. And then when you combine it, there's another third where uh, factors that affect the female and male combined causes infertility, right? So it's an equal game here, right? When you look at infertility, it's not just about the female. It's both male and female and the combination of the two. So it's very important to understand that because oftentimes it is the women who go through very uh, rigorous processes through the infertility clinics and so forth to determine if they can get pregnant or go through that uh, fertility route during IVFs, etc. So there are multiple factors affecting infertility. Today we're going to go over some more facts about infertility. And in the incoming weeks, we will go ahead in depth and discuss different factors that affect the male and the female in the causes of infertility, okay? So, facts about infertility. The impaired ability to get pregnant or conceive affects 11% of the population. That's a pretty high percentage. The CDC says 6% of women in the United States are infertile. Right, 6%. 25% of infertile couples have more than one factor contributing to their fertility. So it's not just um, maybe diabetes. Maybe it's not just polycystic ovarian syndrome. Most of them will have more than just one factor. In 40% of infertile couples, the male is either the sole cause or a contributing cause. I think that's a very important number there. 40% of infertile couples, when you look at them, the male is either the sole cause or a contributing cause. So when we look at infertility, it's not just about the women. The men have a, a huge impact on infertility. So the men need to, you know, go and figure out why they have, uh, why they are a contributing factor to the infertility uh, process, okay? 
Irregular ovulation or menstruation accounts for 25% of all female problems. So if a female can't ovulate correctly, or they have irregular menstruation where it's, you know, skip a month or uh, have two in a month or they have uh, PCOS or they have insulin issues, right? That accounts for about 25%. 12% is due to the overweight or underweight female. So <clears throat> when you look at someone who's very thin, you say, oh, wow, they're so lucky, they're thin. But in actuality, if you don't have enough body fat, you will have a higher, uh, a harder time conceiving. Also, if you are overweight, you will have a harder time conceiving, right? So being underweight and overweight can be modulated relatively easily if you just kind of look at the dietary intake and so forth, right? There are other factors obviously affected in fertility. Uh, particularly with males where you have issues with low sperm count or motility issues of the sperm or they have other metabolic factors in the male that uh, affects the, in, uh, the health of the, um, the sperm. Also smoking is a big factor uh, in terms of fertility issues whether the male smokes or the female smokes or they both smoke. So infertility can be affected in many different ways. In the next coming weeks, we're going to go ahead and delve deep into the underlying mechanisms of infertility, right? How do we correct that? What are we looking for? How do we test for this, right? It's very um, important for uh, everyone to understand when you're trying to get pregnant that it's both a male and a female factor and that both need to understand or be on the same page in terms of what to do for them to get pregnant. Today, we're gonna to continue on the journey of infertility. Last week, we talked about the different statistics about inf infertility and different male factors and female factors uh, related to infertility. Today, we're gonna to talk about the eight steps for a healthy pregnancy. We're just talking about the processes that we go through in trying to eliminate and improve uh, health of the patient as well as the pregnancy, right? So let's get into it. Number one, the normalization of the menstrual cycle. If you have abnormal menstruation, it is difficult to get pregnant. So if you have something like fibroids or PCOS or these types of things where your menstruation is impacted and it's not on a regular basis, it will certainly impact the ability to get pregnant. Optimization of the female follicles and the male sperm, as well as the anatomy, right? You have to have proper nutrition and lifestyle changes in order to have proper health of the follicles of the female, as well as the sperm of the males. We'll go into that in depth later on, okay? Optimization of maintaining a healthy pregnancy. Optimization of the fetal health and development, right? You have to make sure during pregnancy that the, the mother is at its uh, healthiest uh, position, meaning their sleep habits, stress habits, work habits, right? You can't put your body through abnormal stressors through a pregnancy. Reduce the risk for pregnancy complications. Reduce the risk of childhood disorders and adult disorders, right? The advent of a lot of neurological problems, things like ADD, ADHD, and neurodevelopmental issues is very prevalent uh, currently, right? So if you want to optimize uh, a mother's health so they can go into a healthy pregnancy, healthy fetal development, and healthy childhood development, you have to optimize the nutrition and lifestyle of that patient, right? So we'll go into that at a, at a later date. Reduced the risk for maternal postpartum disorders. What a lot of people don't actually know is that because of hormonal shifts, there's a shift in their immune system of the mother before pregnancy, during pregnancy, and postpartum. 
There are a lot of conditions that will show up after pregnancy, such as autoimmune disease. One of the most common ones is Hashimoto's thyroiditis or a, a, a thyroid issue. So you have that common patient who comes in and they had a, a, a good pregnancy. Once they deliver the baby, they are tired, fatigued, run down, they have no energy, uh, they get depressed, and they often just say it's postpartum, right? Postpartum depression. And they're given a antidepressant. What we find in our clinic is that a lot of women who have depression and have all these fatigue issues uh, is related to thyroid. They have shifted their hormones and basically it has triggered an autoimmune response of the thyroid. So they have Hashimoto's thyroiditis and it's not uh, an antidepressant they need. They, may need. they might need a thyroid hormone, but if they have an autoimmune condition, you have to address the dietary lifestyle issues. Of course, postpartum, the mother will be run down, right? They're breastfeeding, they're getting up in the middle of the night, they're not sleeping well, etc. So uh, obviously that needs to be addressed. But what we find is that postpartum depression and all these other signs and symptoms, you must check for a thyroid condition, okay? Optimizing the maternal health recovery after pregnancy. In a lot of cultures, they take a lot of time for recovery, up to three months of recovery. And in a lot of Asian cultures, the mother will do pretty much nothing, and maybe the mother-in-law or someone will come and help them uh, for a month period at least, right? So uh, recovery after pregnancy is very important, so you don't develop other issues down the line, like joint pain, let's say, right? Um, so optimizing maternal health after Pregnancy is very important for long-term health uh, impacts for that mother. And here I start here, rule out anatomical causes, right? If you have to, you have to rule out anatomical causes of infertility first, right? Because if you have an anatomical issue, you can't get pregnant. It doesn't matter what nutrition you're taking. If you have an abnormal uh, physiology or blockage of, of, of the fallopian tubes, you have to get that corrected. So anatomical uh, causes of infertility need to be addressed first, then you can go into all these different steps, right? Uh, next week, we're going to go into all the different causes of anatomical issues for infertility. So stay tuned for that. Today, we're going to talk about the anatomical causes of infertility. Listed behind me, we have some common causes for infertility. And of the maybe five different types of causes, three of them can be anatomical, right? So a ovulatory disorder is about 25% of people who are uh, having difficulty getting pregnant. Then you have endometriosis, which is about 15%, pelvic adhesions, 12%, tubal blockage, 11%. And then you have another condition called hyperprolactinemia. The ones in red right here are anatomical causes. So what are the anatomical causes, you say? Pelvic and abdominal surgery. Pelvic infections. If you had a bad infection, you can develop adhesions in the abdominal cavity or around the, the uterus and fallopian tubes. Abdominal trauma or significant trauma to the abdomen malignancies, things like cancer, etc., And those all need to be ruled out by your medical doctor, right? And then you have benign growths, right? They're not cancerous, but they have growths. Most common is uterine fibroids, uterine cysts, ovarian cysts, ovarian benign tumors, right? These all can be a, a hindrance to getting pregnant. So when you have an anatomical cause that needs to be corrected, um, before going through all the IEVF treatments or nutritional protocols and um, going through this whole process, the anatomical portions need to be taken care of first, okay? So next week, what we're going to do is explain some of the testing that can be done to rule out these anatomical deficiencies or anatomical blockages that will uh, prevent uh, a female from getting pregnant. So when we look at what the percentage can be, it's quite high, right? We're looking at 27, 38%, right? 
38% can be due to a physical anatomical uh, condition that can be corrected. So it's very important to rule those things out prior to going through um, expensive procedures and so forth um, to get pregnant. In the past couple of weeks, we've been talking about infertility and the different causes and mechanisms. We spoke about how anatomical blockages or anatomical causes need to be ruled out, uh, especially in women as well as men. But what kind of tests do we do in order to figure out why you might have an anatomical issue, right? So the three main causes that we talk about in terms of an anatomy is endometriosis, pelvic adhesions, and tubal blockage uh, related to different cysts or growths or non uh, benign growths, etc. So we have to make sure the anatomy is intact so you can get pregnant. And in order to do that, you have to figure out where the problem may be um, occurring. So in terms of testing, how do we figure that out? So when you go to your typical OBGYN, your gynecological ultrasounds can be done. The ultrasound is non-invasive and it's a general uh, test to see what the, um, the pelvic structure looks like, basically the uterus. There is a pelvic ultrasound that, that can be done from the outside or a transvaginal ultrasound that can look at the structures a little bit more in detail. So that can be uh, simply done through your OBGYN, okay? Now, there are also tests like MRIs that look at um, soft tissue in the abdomen, and you can find different growths or cysts and so forth um, through the MRI imaging test, right? Another one is called, a big word here, hysterosalpingogram. So this is where they use a dye, right? And they will insert it into the uterus. And basically they're looking at the general structure of the uterus um, space-wise, and then the patency of the fallopian tubes. So it's very important to make sure that the fallopian tubes are open to the ovaries. Another one is called hysteroscopy, or they use a miniature camera and they'll insert it into the uh, vagina, vagina, into the uterus, and look at the different mucosal um, imaging. So it looks at the kind of the health, uh, visual health of the mucosa of the uterus, to see if there's any cysts or any types of defects within the uterine wall. Okay. The other one is a laparoscopy. This is looking for more like endometriosis or abdominal adhesions, not necessarily within the uterus, but outside of the uterus. So they'll make a small incision in the abdomen and they'll use a camera to look in and see if there is abnormal tissue growth, adhesions, uh, cysts, growth outside of the uterus. So that's a good way to do it. So if you're going to figure out, do we have an anatomical cause, right, of any of these, we need to do certain tests. Initially, you'll do the non-invasive stuff first and then you can go into more invasive things. So uh, there are a lot of um, places that do IVFs um, or infertility clinics and so forth, and sometimes they will do it. So it's very important to figure out the anatomical causes of infertility before moving forward into all the nutritional aspects, uh, dietary aspects, uh, et cetera, all right? My name is Dr. Jin Sung, where clinical excellence meets excellent results. If you like this video, go ahead and like it and share it with other friends so it can help them out. All right, we'll see you guys on the healthy side next week.